Somewhere in these waters lies the answer to one of the world's most deadly mysteries. In the last 100 years, a thousand ships and countless lives have been lost within the Bermuda Triangle. Now, with state-of-the-art technology, we're going to explore the powerful, some would say, evil forces at work out here. Since Columbus first sailed into the area and saw strange lights in the sky, the list of unexplainable disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle has grown. Thousands of ships and planes have simply vanished without a trace. No warning, no distress calls, no wreckage, nothing. Legend has it that the Triangle covers the seas between Bermuda to Miami down to Puerto Rico, one and a half million square miles of treacherous water. Hurricanes, intense storms and rough seas are the main killers out here. The weather can change from benign to deadly in a matter of minutes. The US Coast Guard reports that around 120 boats vanish each year without a trace. It is these unexplainable disappearances that keep the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle alive. But it is not just boats. In the skies above, aircraft have also vanished. Richard Weiner has written many best-selling books about these strange disappearances. We don't know our own planet. We know more about the moon. We're probably learning more about Mars than we know of our own planet. We know about the Earth, but we don't know about the sea. The boatyards of Key West hum with stories about those who never came back. Stories of giant sea monsters, cosmic time warps, spinning compasses and holes in the ocean that swallowed ships have echoed throughout the world. Yet the disappearances continue. For years, the secrets buried in the watery heart of the Triangle have remained hidden. But there is one iconic disappearance that happened on the 5th of December, 1945, that has continued to baffle the world. Six months after the end of World War II, Naval Air Station Fort Lauderdale on the east coast of Florida was still busy. The 14 members of routine training flight 19 had just departed on their final qualifying flight over water. In charge was an experienced pilot, Lieutenant Charles Taylor. The flight would take them east to the Bahamas and then back again in just over two and a half hours. follows is based entirely on the original radio transcripts. FT-28 to Barsi. You seem to be taking us off the Assan navigational course. Over. Uh, negative, Lieutenant Taylor. According to my compass, I am on the correct course. Ensign Barsi, we are not on the planned route. I'll assume lead and correct our position. Over. Roger, Lieutenant.
ours? It's not making much sense. How long have we been in the air? We've been airborne one hour, 45 minutes. We should be seeing land by now. There's nothing out there. I got a call on the intercom, or the squawk box, as we used to call them. The control tower called me and said, it looks like, uh, Commander, it looks like we got a flight in trouble. Roger that, over. So what exactly is going on out there? Sir. Fox Terror 28, this is Fort Lauderdale. What is your current position, over? Fort Lauderdale Tower. We are unable to confirm our current position, over. FT-28, FT-28, you just need to head due west, due west, do you read? Roger that. We don't know which way is west. Everything is wrong. Now, 60 years later, the file on Flight 19 is about to be reopened. Phil Giles is an air accident investigator. Advancements in aviation theory should help him determine what happened, where, and why. It's fascinating that you can still look at something which happened that long ago and put a new light on it. You can probably read things in the evidence which an inquiry would not read. And to cut into that is quite rewarding. A few miles south of Fort Lauderdale at Port Everglades Communication Center, Radio Man Second Class Melvin Baker began to pick up signals that a flight was in trouble. Fort Lauderdale, this is FT-28. We now have land in sight. Looks like the winds have blown us over the Florida Keys, but I'm not sure how far down. And I'm not sure how to get to Fort Lauderdale from my current position. Over. If you're in the Keys, then put the sun on your port wing and fly north up the coast until you get to Miami. Fort Lauderdale is 20 miles further on. Roger that. Can't be over the keys. The winds are coming from the southwest, which would blow them out over the Atlantic. The personnel in the tower and myself just got pretty quiet because of the hopeless feeling that there was nothing you could do. You tried everything. Hang on. How much flying time do they have left? Enough fuel to fly until 20 hundred hours, Commander. This is three hours to get him back. At 5.20 p.m., Radio Man Baker began to realize that Flight 19 was closer to home than they thought. I just turned down the power. We don't seem to be getting very far. FT-28, this is Port Everglades. How do you read me? Over. Port Everglades, this is FT-28. Reading you clearly. Okay, Lieutenant, I estimate that if you fly southwest, it should bring you toward me. As I turn down the power here, if I can still hear you, it'll mean you are definitely flying toward me. Roger. Welcome. He's definitely not over the Gulf. FT-28 to Port Everglades. Listen, Baker, if I am that close to you, I should be able to see land. You might not sight land if you're parallel to us, or... Sir, please, you have enough fuel to reach us. Just keep flying toward me. Baker! I don't think this is the right direction. FT-28 to Fort Lauderdale, do you have a fix yet? Your transmissions are fading. Repeat, your transmissions are fading. What is your bearing? Over. FT-28, this is Port Everglades. 
You have enough fuel to reach us. Do you read me? FT-28 to Fort Lauderdale. Do you have a fix yet? I'm turning down the volume, and I, and I can still hear them. They must be flying toward me. Why are they ignoring me? Maybe we should fly 270 degrees until we hit the beach or run out of gas. Taylor. Taylor, do you read? We didn't fly far enough east before we turned. How long have we been going in this direction? Where in the hell are we? Radio Man Baker was the last one to hear anything. Fox Tear 28, this is Port Everglades. Do you read me over? He knew from their weakening radio signals that they were heading out to sea. This is Port Everglades, FT 28, do you read me over? Fox Tear 28, do you read me over? Oh, come on. Nothing was ever heard from them again. The final twist to the mystery that night was when a Martin Mariner rescue plane set out to look for them. 27 minutes later, it too vanished into thin air. Solving the Bermuda Triangle's most iconic mystery will take all Phil's experience. To start with, he believes he can find a straightforward explanation for why no trace of Flight 19 was ever found. It may also explain why so many others disappear without a trace. The answer lies in Miami. This is the headquarters of the 7th District Miami Coast Guard, the largest and busiest in the world. Phil wants to know how it's possible Flight 19 could have disappeared without a trace, why no bodies and no wreckage were ever found. Were they looking in the wrong place or was there some other reason? Commander Camilo Bazzano may have the answers. So if you take it back to the 1945, yes. we had no technology, right. probably 200 miles offshore. You had a rough sea, Rain shower is completely overcast. Very difficult. Any chance of finding? Very difficult, yes. Yeah. Just to give you some perspective, just of today, uh, even if we do our search as perfectly as we possibly can in, in the most benign weather conditions, flat seas, no wind, perfect search conditions for the aircraft and crew, our best percentage of finding someone, what we call a probability of detection, is 78%. We're going down, We're going down. Those aircraft were sunk very quickly. Essentially, if you're not looking in the first hour of them being reported lost and having an asset on scene, uh, they're essentially looking for persons in the water. In perfect conditions, the planes would have floated for two minutes. But the seas were rough that night, and the Avengers would have sunk within seconds. The Coast Guard has devised a potentially dangerous exercise in order to demonstrate how difficult it is to find anyone or anything at sea. ideal, pretty much light wind, seas are probably about two feet or less, excellent visibility. A second helicopter is about to drop an experienced swimmer in the water. In a few minutes, they'll see if they can find him again. What we'll do is we'll kind of go out about, about uh, 200 yards off to the left from there, and then we'll go up and we'll see how close we have to be to actually find him. 
With 30 minutes of fuel left and the current pulling the swimmer further north every minute, the pressure's on. But at least this time, they know roughly where he is. We've got a swimmer inside, I believe, out there at uh, 11 o'clock. Keep your turn in. Gonna keep your turn in. Keep your turn in. Coming up at 12 o'clock. Roll out. You can see how the white cat's breaking right around them. It's really hard to shoot. You can see, you can barely see the man like this. And he's wearing an orange neoprene suit and a big old snorkel on top. And basically, you need to fly right over top of them to be able to see them. At nighttime, it'd be almost impossible, I would say, to see them unless you had an extremely bright moon on, uh, on flat seas. But back in 1945, the weather was bad. For six days, the largest air-sea rescue since the war searched in vain. Nothing was ever found. I'm not surprised they disappeared without a trace, because that does happen occasionally here for people that we try to go look for sometimes. We don't find anybody, even to this day. But if the weather conditions were as bad as described to me, and there would probably be very little evidence of any kind of debris field or oil slick on the surface of the water even an hour after the incident took place. So even today, the chances of finding anyone alive or any evidence of Flight 19 would be nil. But it is still not enough to explain why the flight went so badly wrong. Phil is convinced there is something else. Any who know these waters believe they are the most dangerous in the world. But how do they get such a fearsome reputation? There is an old mariner's tale that describes the sea literally opening up and swallowing ships. Could there be any truth in this? The first clue emerged in 1985 when cameras captured these extraordinary pictures. An oil platform in the North Sea punctured a vast gas pocket beneath the seafloor and almost sank. Gas deposits like this exist all around the coastlines of the world. The Bermuda Triangle is no exception. Trapped in the sediment, the gas is highly volatile. An undersea earthquake or landslide could release it into the waters above. Could gas bubbles really create a hole in the ocean? Naval physicist Professor Bruce Donado has come to Florida to find out. Bruce is going to try and sink this boat in the ocean off this beach in order to simulate if ships like these can sink in a mass of gas bubbles. Up until now, it's all been theory. The experiment is large scale and will be the first of its kind. Then it goes to the manifold. Bruce is going to be helped on the practical side by Hollywood special effects designer, Phil Beck. No one has ever attempted an experiment like this before. The aim is to recreate a small scale methane gas eruption similar to the one that happened in the North Sea. So they're building a massive lattice of pipes, which will then be sunk onto the sea floor. They will then pump a vast amount of air, which has similar properties to methane, into the lattice. The air will then be forced out of the pipes through small holes into the water above. Turn them on. Yeah. Very turbulent situation, so the, bo the boat's bobbing up and down, but there's a definite loss of buoyancy. With 25% air in the water, the boat should have sunk. 
However, there is something they haven't anticipated. It's not dropping very much. That's not a good sign. The bubbles themselves lower the density, makes it sink, but the upward force due to the flow of the water is keeping the boat up. It looks like the two roughly cancel each other. Yeah, come on over. There is a neutralizing effect in the center of the bubble field, which means the sinking zone must be just outside the center. Time is running out, and there is only one more thing Bruce can try. Now, if we get a little bit off center, it's much better, you know? There the flow, it doesn't tend to push the boat up, boat up but out. See that? Instant drop. There we go, is it going? Yeah, Come she's on. going, because what's happening is the front's more buoyant than the back. Looking good. If you were a 500-foot boat, and your 200 foot would have hit one of these things, and your back 300 foot weren't, your boat would just snap in half and sink instantly. What's happening is, is the front is lifting and the stern is dropping, because the front is in more dense water than the stern. 30 seconds, she's gone. It's looking real good. No, she's gone. It's she's going. gone. That's she's it. gone. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. They've done it. A gas eruption in the ocean really could sink a boat. In the triangle, gas hydrate deposits amount to more than 70 times the gas used by the entire USA in a single year. That's a lot of gas, and if any part of it erupted, it would be enough to sink a whole fleet of freighters. Therefore, it is possible that a few of the more bizarre ship disappearances in the Bermuda Triangle might have been caused by this strange natural phenomenon. So it seems there is truth in at least one of the old mariner's tales. But the truth behind some of the Triangle's biggest mysteries is far more elusive. As explorer Graham Hawkes discovered in 1991, he thought he had found the remains of Flight 19. We were searching for Spanish galleons. We came across one Avenger on the bottom, thought nothing of it, just lugged it. We came across another aircraft, took a look at it with cameras, and Avenger, second one, lugged it. A group of explorers believe they found five American Navy warplanes. The story hit the headlines. Had they found the mythical Flight 19? He promised the media an answer within two weeks. In those days, submarines were far too expensive. So Graham used a remotely operated camera on a wire. The team concluded from the low quality images that these aircraft were probably not from Flight 19. But who were they? The answer would turn out to be just as mysterious. If that wasn't Flight 19, you mean to tell me there's another five Avengers linked up here? And I'd like nice, easy answers. To me, it's much easier that this is the five. Of course it's the five. Of course they went into the sea. Here they are. There's no mystery here. Here they are. No mystery. It's much, much more untidy if it isn't Flight 19, and we have to find out where they are. Graham Hawkes is now going to return to the five mysterious planes and this time, he's going to go down there himself and find out once and for all who they are. Twelve miles off the coast of Fort Lauderdale, a state-of-the-art research vessel from Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institution is about to join the hunt for the Lost Avengers. It's a very big ocean out here, and to find a group of five gaggled together like that that's the question. What are they doing there? There's something about coming back in person. You find things with remote technology, and it just leaves this itch. This time we have the sea links immersible, so this time we get to go and almost touch them and smell them, and uh, I think we have a much, much better chance of finding out who they are. Graham has waited 12 years for this moment. Good morning. Good morning. 
Let's go see some airplanes. It will take 15 minutes to reach the seabed, 734 feet below the ship. In the back of the submersible is Harold Larkin, an expert on Avenger design. The trip is deeply personal to Harold because not only did he fly Avengers, but one of his relatives was on Flight 19 when it disappeared. Two hundred yards, three one zero. Thank you. The Johnson Sea Link submersible is the perfect tool for this kind of forensic work. The object of the mission is to find each wreck's unique code, called the bureau number. This is the only way to make a definite identification. We have a contact on sonar, a large contact, and we're moving in on it. I'd say the chances of five planes being this close together are about the same as hitting a hole in one and getting struck by lightning while having a winning lottery ticket in your pocket. They would have to go in near each other at about the same speed and the same time, or the currents around here would have spread them apart further than this, even if they were all from the same flight. So whatever happened, happened all at once to these five airplanes. Oh. But there is no record in the naval archives of another flight of five Avengers going down at the same time in the same place. The mystery deepens. Dan, can you give us a status update? We have a plane in sight. FT-20. Could be an eight or a three. It looks, uh, yeah. It's more like a three. Yeah. Okay, busted off, tail's gone. Ah. Okay, how the fuselage is um, sheared off just after the trailing edge of the wing. We may never find it. The fuselage number, FT-23, means it came out of Fort Lauderdale, but it's not enough to identify the aircraft. When an Avenger was lost, the same numbers were often repainted on their replacements. The wing flaps are down, which means the plane ditched, but why may never be known. Okay, okay. We need to move on. Um, I hate to, uh, hate to give up on this. It seems the Bermuda Triangle won't give up its secrets so easily. Phil is now ready to investigate why Flight 19 went wrong. The problem with looking back at something in the past like this is you can never ask that extra question, so you have to deal with the evidence that's available to you. The one thing that isn't covered in any detail is probably one of the most significant causal factors in the flight being lost, and that is the human factors. It wasn't normal at that time to look in any detail into human factors. year, around 30 light aircraft go missing within the Triangle. Carol Collins, an experienced instructor, is going to help Phil get into the mindset of a pilot in difficulty in this area. 
Okay, we're level at 1,500 feet. When you're flying over an area that has no visual landmarks, it's very easy to lose your sense of motion. For instance, if we started out on a prime heading of east, made a turn to the west as we did, and then turn toward the south, if you're making very gradual turns and you're not being very, very cognizant of what you're doing there, you'll find yourself in a whole other direction than you thought you were. One of the unique navigational hazards in the Bermuda Triangle is becoming more obvious to fill from the air. When you're looking at strings of islands, if there's no houses on them, if there's nothing to identify them, one island can pretty much look like another, as you'll see as we come around and go up here. Right now, we're in good shape because we can look back and we can see, oh, there, there's the highway. But if we couldn't see that highway, one of these islands could, would just look so much like another. And in times of poor visibility, that's a serious issue. So getting lost does happen. We must be over the southern gulf. Well, that's the gulf, don't you think? The gulf, negative. We've gone too far east. I strongly suggest we fly west until we run out of gas. We have a better chance of being picked up close to shore. I don't know. We didn't even see the shore. Just watch the gas, men. Back on the ground, Phil can now begin to understand what happened to Flight 19, where and why. Flight 19 was going to go on navigation plan one, they called it. It was a basic triangle. And it started off at Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station. And they fly an easterly track from there to these islands here, known as Hen and Chickens, where they were going to do 20 minutes low-level bombing practice. The next leg was onto a track passing over Grand Bahama Island to Great Sail Kai up in the north of the island and then return to Fort Lauderdale. So at what point in the training leg do you think they actually went wrong? Well, I think they went wrong after the bombing run at Hen and Chickens Island. The winds were stronger than anticipated that day and pushed them northeast from their intended track. They overshot the turn north at Cistern Cay and instead made the turn at Great Abaco Island. If they had been on track, they would have expected to see Grand Bahama Island directly in front of them. If he had been on track, he would have expected to see land lying across his track, Great Bahamas at right angles. But what he's actually seeing is land paralleling his track. So it may, in his mind, think, Hang on, my compass says north, but the land is to my right. It should be in front of me. Therefore, my compass is reading wrongly. And I think what they've done then is they've carried on until they've come to the northern part of this island. Then they've seen this small run of islands going up here in a north-westerly direction. They've followed that when they're saying, we think we're over the Keys. Looks like the winds have blown us over the Florida Keys, but I'm not sure how far down. And I don't know how to get to Fort Lauderdale from our current position over. It was at this point that Commander Poole had become concerned. Taylor was flying over a small string of islands north of Great Abaco. He mistook them for the similar looking islands in the Florida Keys, over 200 miles away. This extraordinary error means Taylor has put himself over the Gulf of Mexico on the opposite side of Florida. So all the headings he flies thereafter are taken on the premise that he is over here in the Gulf of Mexico rather than over here in the North Atlantic. So they are virtually the opposite, direct, the opposite to the headings that you would need to fly. So he's actually trying to get back to mainland Florida and flying himself further out to sea in the yes, Atlantic that, that, Ocean. Yes, that, that is it. Simply, it, he's heading for the wrong part of the coast. At 734 feet down, Graham Hawkes has found the fifth and final wreck. Oh, there we go. Here we go, we got it. Will this ghostly Avenger be able to tell them its story? FT-88. 
37. Okay, well, the um, good news is the canopy is back, which means the full crew probably got out there. Just, can we go and um, take a good look at the tail section? Yeah. If we can find anything there. The wreck is in good condition, but like the others, it is missing its tail. They're beginning to think the Phantom Five don't want to be identified. We want to show you something, uh, Howard. I think this may be the um, vertical rudder. Well, I could turn sideways. Right in front of us now. Where? And underneath, there's a little wing coming in the section into view now. Your left wing. Um, in the middle of what? Right in the middle of the screen. Right. I can see something out of the porthole. Holy cow. They're there, then we should get a bureau number. It's the difference between human eyes and a camera. At last, NAV 23990. This is the bureau number, unique to each aircraft. It will tell Graham how it came to be here. <laughs> <laughs> With their mission accomplished, they head back to the surface. It's the 4th of July, and while Florida celebrates, Graham is already tucked into the naval accident reports. It's the moment he's waited for for 12 years. NAV 23990 lost at sea. On the 9th October 1943, FT-87 piloted by Ensign George Swint was returning to Fort Lauderdale from a bombing run. On board were Airman 2nd Class Sam Trees and Jay Lewillis. At precisely 12.20 p.m. the engine suffered a catastrophic loss of fuel and ditched. Swint and his crew survived. FT-87 lost for 60 years. Graham now knows how she got here. Of the remaining four wrecks, one is missing its tail section. And there is only one accident report from August 1944 showing a fatal mid-air collision where the tail was destroyed. Could this be the final resting place of pilot John Barry and airmen third class Joe Market and Fred Burns? For Graham, it's the scenario he least expected. Despite the odds, they are just a random collection of accidents that came to rest in the same place 12 miles from home. Based on the information from several radio or HFDF stations from 1945, Phil can now make a guess at where Flight 19 ditched. The various HFDF stations produced a very good fix at 10 minutes to 6. And as you can see, it's up in the North Atlantic, about 100 miles off Daytona Beach, nowhere near the Gulf of Mexico. But by the time the tower received the fix, Flight 19 was already out of range. Ironically, that fix put them only 25 minutes from Daytona Beach. At that stage, they were still going west towards home. At 7.15, they were overheard discussing turning east. At 7.45, they would have had enough fuel to continue for another 15 minutes. Which means they probably ditched here. About 220 miles east of Daytona Beach. We now have a clearer idea what happened that night. The question is why did an experienced pilot like Taylor not realize this gross error? What was going on in his mind? 
Okay, Lieutenant, if you have enough fuel to reach us, just keep flying toward me. Baker! I don't think this is the right direction. FT28 to Fort Lauderdale, do you have a fix yet? He established the mindset fairly early on after he had realized he wasn't on the correct track that he was in the Keys at Florida. Phil has concluded that as conditions deteriorated, Taylor had a serious mental breakdown, a kind of tunnel vision that made him blind to any of the options he was offered. I don't think you could be over the Keys. Our wind chart suggests you can't have been blown in that direction. Today, this condition is known as spatial disorientation. It is considered to be one of the most dangerous threats to a pilot. There was no shaking it. And this is not an unusual phenomenon. People decide on something, and then with the stress of the occasion, they will stick with that initial concept because in their mind, it's very real. Once he would got this mindset, it was going to stay with him until forever because no one was going to jog him out of it. This would explain why Taylor insisted his compass wasn't working. We don't know which way is west. Everything is wrong. But what about the rescue plane that also disappeared? Martin Mariners were known as flying gas tanks. Several had exploded in mid-air due to a spark or even a crewman's cigarette. A few days into the search, a report from a ship in the area claimed it had seen an explosion in the sky at the same time the mariner vanished. I felt hopeless because there's nothing more you can do. The worst night I ever had in my life. After 60 years, what happened to Flight 19 is now clear. And like so many mysteries, there is always a rational explanation available, if you choose to believe it. People love a mystery. They want a mystery. No matter what it is, they want their mystery. Which is why the Bermuda Triangle will remain the most romantic of all the ocean's great myths. Check in and stay the night and enjoy all that Nine has to offer. The hit UK series is here on Nine. Hotel Babylon will get you hooked. 9.30 Sunday and continuing Monday. Nightline is next, the latest from National Nine News.